Johnny Mac with your daily comedy news. According to one new book, says Stephen Colbert, at the White House election night party, some people thought Rudy Giuliani may have been drinking too much. The other people were Rudy Giuliani. Fallon, that's right. Rudy was in rough shape on election night. He was slurring, sweating, confused, and then he started drinking. Colbert, reportedly drunk, Rudy asked, what's happening in Michigan? And they said it was too early to tell. Giuliani said, just say we won. Colbert said, God, Rudy must have been an annoying kid. You're playing tag. You get him on the shoulder. But instead of just admitting it, he says, uh-uh, at the press conference next to a dildo store. Fallon, yeah, if that didn't work, Rudy's other plan was for Trump to legally change his name to Joe Biden. Hey, here's that Joe Rogan article that I never got to last weekend. I had promised it for last weekend. Let me be honest. I went to the beach on Friday afternoon. And I had a great time. So I used my generic stash of weekend stuff. And then, um, you know, then it was Monday already. So we'll do it today from the New York Times. Joe Rogan is too big to cancel. He's now one of the most consumed media products on the planet. His Spotify deal estimated at $100 million. Speaks to the allure of making audiences feel they're in on something subversive. Back in the day, other comics called him Little Ball of Anger, semi-affectionately, never to his face, a man flammable by bearing and branding, it seemed, with his taekwondo muscles and a scorching conviction that the Bible had some holes. Mr. Rogan, 53, is one of the most conceived media products on the planet, a fact well known to legions of men under 40, nonsensical to the many Rogan unaware over 50, and befuddling by his own admission to the man himself, What's different now is the social capital he's managed to accumulate while proudly defying the traditional gatekeeping strictures of mainstream fame. It's a story of persistence, timing, and a keen feel for the prevailing cultural winds. He started recording himself nearly a dozen years ago for a live web assemblage of hundreds. There were no network censors. His first sponsor was a sex toy. Some comics could find Mr. Rogan's performative belligerence tiresome, privately referring to him and his brawny friends and followers as the Cobra Kai. Even today, many comedians are reluctant to speak critically of Mr. Rogan in public, conscious of his present platform and zealous fans, and well-versed in his capacity to unsettle presumed adversaries, even before he had such power. John Caparulo said, He just had that vibe where I don't want to have too long a conversation with him because I don't want to say the wrong thing. Caparulo said he admired Mr. Rogan at the time, but has since taken a dim view after some of the podcasters orbit antagonized Mr. Caparulo publicly saying, he's just a guy who can flip out, and then where are you? Caparulo recalled a fellow comic passing him at the door one night when Rogan was on stage. That comic said, there he is, the unhappiest millionaire. Continuing with the New York Times article, Rogan has appeared to attribute his own popularity to an underserved market, recently recalling the bafflement of advertising professionals over his audience. They're like, Jesus Christ, he's got like 94% men. Like, what's going on here? I'm like, it's because they're not represented. Men are not represented. Over the past year, Rogan made two big moves. One was intuitive enough. He relocated with his family from L.A. to Austin, declaring L.A. overcrowded and overtaxed. The second was the move to Spotify. The show saw an initial audience dip as listeners were compelled to download Spotify for free to hear him. And Mr. Rogan's ubiquity on YouTube has seemed to wane some. Now, beneath the bridge clips still permitted to appear on YouTube, users often accuse Mr. Rogan of selling out. Among top Spotify leadership, people familiar with the company say the notion that Mr. Rogan presents any kind of regrettable executive headache is laughable, though some diehards may grumble, like fans of Howard Stern, perpetually convinced he's gone soft. Uh, you can add me to that list. We'll talk about that someday. we got to do a deep dive on Howard one of these days. Uh, my short take there is if 1985 Howard Stern had a chance to attack 2021 Howard Stern, 1985 Howard Stern would destroy this guy. But we digress. Mr. Rogan's following remains young, loyal, and increasingly global. So central is he to Spotify's fortunes that the podcast is listed in its own category on the app. Sports, music, news, politics, Joe Rogan. The question now, as Mr. Rogan settles into his king-making phase is how he might like to use his capital. He does seem to like the idea of people coming to him in every sense and the power that flows from commanding a platform so large that even those who might feel more comfortable elsewhere, such as elected officials, scientists, the occasional journalist, recognize that ignoring him would be irresponsible. Rogan has taken care to promote comedians in his circle, making explicit his goal of expanding the comedy footprint in Austin, 
and opening his own club. Friends have teased him about being this generation's Johnny Carson, the host whose blessing could mint stars overnight, and his new address has already produced a gravitational drift among comics of a certain ilk. He is this generation's Johnny Carson. I think that's well said. Andrew Dice Clay said, all these comics are moving there to be near him. You want to talk about leeches, parasites? Let the guy breathe. What are you, parked outside his house waiting for him to go? You want to be on the show today? And there's now a kind of Rogan sub-economy of comedian podcasters whom he helped gain exposure. Their public personas likewise built in part around scorning political correctness and the institutions associated with it. The New York Times emailed one such Rogan friend, Tim Dillon. Tim's podcast comes out on Sundays. It's really good. But I'm telling you, Tim Dillon is eventually going to step on the landmine and I'm going to deny I ever told you to listen to the show. I'm just telling you right now. I'm going to be like, Tim Dillon? Never heard of him. But today... It's a really funny podcast. Check it out. Uh, When the New York Times emailed Tim Dillon asking to chat about Rogan, Dillon responded with an expletive and posted the exchange to his hundreds of thousands of followers on social media. What followed was a striking testament to Mr. Rogan's eclectic constituencies and their assessment of the treatment in the press. One segment Chiron on One American News Network said, New York Times gearing up for hit piece on Joe Rogan. Rogan was recently at an outdoor bar in Austin after a stand-up set. He was flanked by a muscular associate who stepped in to tell an encroaching reporter, if you don't know him, that's not a good idea. Really? Jeez. Mr. Rogan bore the markings of a person at peace staying past 1.30 a.m. to accept praise and kibitz with friends. The AV Club asked my friend Kristen Schaal, what's the worst job you've ever had? Kristen Schaal said, there have been a couple, but I think the one that I struggled with the most was when I was a character at FAO Schwartz in New York. They had created this character to sell candy, and she was called Miss Peppermint Twist. It was a nightmare. I didn't know how to do it. I had to stand in the candy shop and convince kids to get more candy. I was wearing a pink wig. I just remember that I didn't really love her backstory, or she didn't have one, so I created one about how she fell in a vat of cotton candy and got disfigured and had to live and work in FAO Schwartz. The kids loved it. I just couldn't figure out how to be this character for like five hours. I remember I started drinking on the subway to get myself into gear, which I never do. I enjoy drinking, but I'll never do it on the job. It was just so miserable. She wound up working there for less than a year. I'm pretty sure they let me go. They realized the character actor program wasn't really working for them. They had a lot. They had a toy soldier. They tried to do a bunch of them, and they were also about to file for bankruptcy. So I don't want to say it was my performance, but I definitely got let go. Getting fired from a job or getting broken up with or dumped is the best thing that could happen for me because I'll never quit anything. And The Onion ran a funny parody story. It is called The Office Actors Launch Podcast, urging fans to try something new. Every week, your favorite actor from Dunder Mifflin will lead you on a deep dive onto the numerous other ways Office fans can spend their time instead of starting the series over again. (laughs) Good stuff from The Onion. That's your comedy news for today. Follow this show on Spotify, where you can hear Joe Rogan, Uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your shows. See you tomorrow.